uh, let us be in a spirit of prayer together. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we pray that in these moments that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So here we are. Here we are. Uh, we have finished up a series of the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, and now we uh, are focusing today on a scripture about uh, eternal life. A scripture about eternal life. Uh, there's something that uh, I'd like to start with and share with you. And it's from Matt Redman. And it's just a lyrics of a song. And it's uh, called, You Never Let Go. And it says, Oh no, you never let go. Through the calm, through the storm. Oh no, you never let go. Every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go. You never let go of me. And that's how I see God's love. God never lets go. God's love is eternal. God's love is eternal now and through the kingdom of heaven. When we entered into that wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ, each of us, wherever that was, however you remember that to have happened, when we enter into that relationship, we realize that through Jesus, and Jesus as the risen Lord, that we have eternal life. And Jesus will never let go of us. You might look at it as walking along and someone right there to hold your hand, even when you feel like maybe there's no one there. Uh, God is with us. God is eternal. God is with us. So I wanted to share that with you uh, about the never letting go, and the part about never, which means forever will hold us and will hold you. That's what God promises to do. Um, you know, um, in the scripture today, you, uh, when you heard the scripture, you probably heard two different things. And the first one was a distraction. But Jesus has a way of using things that are meant as distractions uh, for our good. And I just wanted to lift up the scripture to you today. And as we encounter Jesus, you know, he's in that last week before he's, uh, he's uh, going to be crucified. So he's in the last week and the Sadducees and the religious leaders in general are really kind of grilling him on things. And so the Sadducees, who do not believe in eternal life, do not believe in resurrection, they've decided that they're going to trap him. They're going to make, a, they're going to make a eternity or resurrection look kind of absurd. So they get this idea, and they decide they're going to use the thing called marriage. So one of them comes up to him and says, uh, Master, I want to ask you a question. Or Jesus, I want to ask you a question. Moses said, by the law, that the, the Mosaic law, that if uh, there is a brother and the brother dies and the, the wife does not have a child, that uh, the, the other brother has to marry the woman and, and, you know, for procreation have children. That was part of the laws. It doesn't seem right to us today, but that was part of the covenant so that the, the tribes would go on, the tribes of Israel and that life would continue. It was family taking care of family. That's kind of how they looked at it back then. So that was one of the things they were supposed to do. So he comes up and he says, well, let's say there's seven brothers, and the one brother marries, and uh, he dies, and he doesn't, his wife doesn't have any children. So then the next brother marries her. And so as he has this scenario, he says at the, at the end of this, seven brothers have married this woman. So when the woman dies and they all get to heaven, whose wife is she going to be? That's the first thing we hear about the scripture. Well, Jesus sees right to the heart of things. The Sadducees are trying to, sh to show doubt, to cause doubt in the hearts of folks about this thing called resurrection. So they've gotten this scenario and they're lifting it up to cause that doubt. And saying, this is absurd if there, were, if there, were, if there was a resurrection. So Jesus says, since they used Moses, he's wonderful. He comes right in with Moses. And so 
uh, he, he says, well, first of all, that when people die, in this age they're in, they marry so they can procreate, because people die, they get sick. Uh, but in, in, the, in resurrection and in the age to come, they're like angels. There's no need for them to marry because they don't die. You know, they don't, their bodies don't decay. Life is eternal, it's forever. There's no need to procreate. So marriage is not even an issue there. It's they're like angels, they live eternally. And then so picking up on the idea of Moses said, as the Sadducees did, he says, Moses also said when he came to the bush and he asked who this is, what God this is, Moses said this, that the voice said, this is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he goes on to say, Moses said to you, this is the God, the great I am, the eternal God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the living. He's not the, the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. So Moses would not have been saying that the God is the God of these people if they were dead. They live on through eternity. So Jesus took the idea of the marriage and said, okay, I see what you're doing to cause distraction. I see what you're trying to do to cause doubt. Uh, And this is the case when people die, but this is what the real issue is, and it's eternal life. And the Sadducees were afraid to ask any more questions after that, and so they didn't ask anything else. So thinking of these things, uh, have there been times in your life, maybe as new Christians, where someone uh, might have come up to you and said something and questioned your faith and you didn't know how to respond? Wow, if we had the mind of Jesus all the time, wouldn't that be great? Just, oh yeah, I see that. Well, this is the answer. This, this is the answer that I need to share with you and give you faith. Um, but I want you to, to take that uh, with the scenario that the Sadducees raised, obviously to cause doubt and and uh, make things look absurd. And then Jesus getting right to the heart of the matter, this is really about eternal life. And sharing that and offering that to the Sadducees. Take that, and then I want you to, to I want to share something with you. Uh, when I was very, I guess, new with Christianity, um, the different people came with different questions. And I remember, in particular, I, I, someone came up to me and they were asking, you know, if I went to church, or I might have said something about it, and they said, oh, which one? And I said, whichever church it was, and they said, oh, so you're a Christian. And I said, yeah. And so I won't share you, with you the faith that they were, uh, but they were of a different faith. And they said, well, you know, I don't understand about Christianity. And I'm like, what don't you understand? Um, well, it just seems like that's such a barbaric religion. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, because Think of that. I mean, death on a cross? And, and then eating someone's body and drinking someone's blood? They said, ah, that just doesn't sound right to me. And I was stunned. It's something that we in the church understand what the meaning of it is, but to hear it from a different perspective, from a different religion, stunned me, and I didn't know what to say. And I said, well, let me think about your question, and you know, we'll talk about it. So I was really thinking about that. So I prayed about it, and then I couldn't wait till the opportunity to come back together with this person. And when we came back together, I said, hey, let's follow up on that conversation we were having the other day. Which one? Well, you know, about religion. I want to explain to you about how I understand Christianity. Okay. (laughs) So we, we had this discussion, and I said, first of all, Uh, You know what? Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And I got to know Jesus through an experiential situation where I prayed that Jesus would come into my life and and be there for me and, and give me forgiveness and salvation and strength. It happened as simple as that. I got to know Jesus in that way. And then I want to tell you about the cross. Because the cross isn't something that's barbaric. Humanity did this to Jesus, but Jesus laid down his life for all of us so that we would know how much he loves us. And the bread and the cup that you call, you know, the the body and the blood that we consume, 
Uh, that is our remembering. We come to that holy table because we want to remember, as Jesus told us, that he gave everything he could possibly give for us. His body. He gave his body. The shedding of his blood just laid down his life so that we would know that there is eternal life because he would rise again and show us that death does not have the last word that we would rise again and that we would experience this wonderful thing called eternity. And we would know what it's like to live forever and how much God loves us. Well, you know, you can imagine the person was just really quiet. I said, well, I'll think about that. So I don't know if it made an impact, uh, but I hope that it did. But I think of that scenario and say, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think you've misconstrued. It's absurd what you're saying, eating blood and drinking, drinking blood and eating, eating body. No, you don't understand what we do. We dine together and we remember, we take a nourishment to understand that Jesus gave everything for us. But sharing that with someone is offering them this thing called eternal life. And, and the question, well, how, how did this happen? How would you even think of this person being your savior? Sharing that experience of what was happening in your life and why you came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So people question our faith different times. And the more we hear and the more we experience different religions, we understand their faith. We understand why they're at the place that they are as much as they can share that with us. Uh, they might not have a concept of eternal life. They might not have a concept of Jesus as Lord and Savior. But we are called, whatever question they ask us, you know, let me think about it. You don't have to answer right away. Let me think and pray about it, and, I'll, and we'll talk about it. But whatever question we're asked, it is up to us, just as it was for Jesus, to take that question, show the absurdity of it, and then offer eternal life back to them. Offer that wonderful thing and share our witness with them. Share our witness about what it's like and what we expect heaven to be. Did you hear the wonderful things from the children? When you say heaven, they know about heaven. And they can visualize those golden streets. You know, and, and they're thinking about their, their pets when they're going to be there. They are little angels in heaven to me. Uh, but they can visualize it. And sometimes when we grow and we get older, and maybe we don't have as close of a connection and we don't think about those things as much. Um, but then, you know, there's something that happens to us in this world that brings this eternal thing home with an impact. And that's death. Now, we lift up this beautiful thing today about how Jesus shared this wonderful resurrection and eternal life. But death, the sting of death, has quite an impact. And usually, when people ask us questions about eternal life, it's because they've experienced a tremendous loss. And they want comfort. They need comfort. And they're in pain. And I just want to share with you, just briefly, this isn't, about, this isn't a sermon on death, but I just want to share with you the words that are really beautiful from, from the funeral liturgy. And it says, uh, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, those who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. Those who believe in me, yet, though they die, yet shall they live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You know how comforting that is to folks who really don't know about Jesus as Lord and Savior? or they don't have the concept of eternity. Those words, they lie heavily on the heart, and they absorb them, and they feel comfort. And all the pain that they go through, they understand that there's this wonderful place that their loved one has gone. And they want to be there with that loved one. God has a way of opening doors for us, but we are called to share with one another not at the end of someone's life or to death, but we're called to share right now in the moment because when we, as children of God, share, we are living in the moment. We are living in that eternity. That eternity just as real today as when 
you pass over and you're in the next life, that eternity. No beginning, no end. Just like Jesus, our spirits, our souls with God. So, I'd like to, to say again, um, you know, as Jesus told us, um, there is life after death, and he even goes to the point of saying that, uh, that there is no separation. There is no separation. That he goes to prepare a place for us, and he will come back and take us to himself. So there is no separation. And Jesus did go and prepare that place for us, and it is open to all of us. It's a transition from one life to the next. Eternal life. Well, you think, well, we talked about all the wonderful gifts of the Spirit, and the, well, the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about all the wonderful fruits of the Spirit. But that is living all the abundant joy of the fruit of the Spirit and experiencing that life now, not, not in heaven when we die. Uh, of course, we will then, but it's experiencing all of these precious gifts of eternal life, of that forever love right now through the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness, and, and all of those wonderful things of the Spirit, experiencing them now, and then anticipating what that wonderful time will be in the next life. So don't lose sight of this thing called eternity and think it happens when you die, because we are in relationship with the risen Christ, the eternal Christ, and we are assured that we will continue to live throughout eternity in this relationship with Christ. Romans 8, 28 tells us that. It says, uh, there's nothing, nothing that can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ. So, pray on these things and, and remember from the beginning of the sermon, and that's uh, God will never let go of you. God will never let go. All know you never let go. Through the calm and through the storm, Oh, no, you never let go through the highs and through the lows. Oh, no, you never let go. You never let go of me. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we, we are here in your presence, and we, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for assuring us of your love that will never, ever leave us, will always be with us. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to hold on to you in all of these moments, all of the time that we have together, as you strengthen us and nurture us and, and provide us with the beautiful fruit of the Spirit that grows and, and has root and, and flourishes in your kingdom, growing your kingdom, showing all the uh, eternity love right now, that eternal love and light now and forever. We ask you to bless these words to our heart. We ask this in your holy name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.